Well, hello, friends. Welcome one and welcome all. I can't offer much in this outdoor hall, but sit here and rest. You must be weary, and I'll share with you Tales of Tyria. <laughs> Yes, welcome one, welcome all, this week on Tales of Tyria. We have a lot of little stuff to talk about. Some feedback from last week and some new small concepts to talk about. And hey, beta news, it's coming up. Welcome one, welcome all, welcome to another exciting episode of Tales of Tyria. This week, we've got a great show for you today. Glad you got a hold of the program, however you may have found it. Tell a friend or two about it, won't you? Uh, we are almost live from the Great Rosewind Tavern in the free city of Lion's Arch. I am Bridger, and joining me today is a great cast and crew. Just below me here, we've got Vega. Welcome to the program, sir. Hey, buddy. How's it going? All right. How are you doing? Anything, Pretty good. Anything special good. happening recently? Um, I had to work this weekend, which sucked. But <laughs> I know, that's about man. It. Real life? What the heck's that all about? I know. Real life sucks. <laughs> and also joining us, hasn't been here in a while. Welcome, great. Hey, everyone. Glad to be back. Good to see you again. Yeah. Looks like you've got a, a nice, shiny new webcam and some new digs. Um, not a new webcam. It's the same webcam. It's just I have it's, lighting it's, problems, so I'm trying to figure out where the best place to put the <laughs> lamp in my room is. So I'm like moving it around every time I use the webcam. Well, that's what I had to do. I had to actually get a separate lamp and set it so that it was like shining on the wall behind my monitor, so that the reflection would hit me and it would look better. Because the other thing is, I've got this, you know, this this giant light behind me that turns into like a a, a BF3 flashlight situation. We've talked about that in the past. And the last guest here today, Freelancer. Welcome to the show. How's it going, Bridger? Not, not bad, not bad at all. So we had a, a bit of news this week, guys. Some, some very exciting news. Because we have officially entered the Year of the Dragon. And I'm sure everybody who's listening to this has already heard about this. But just in case, uh, very quickly, I will summarize it <clears throat> thusly. It's coming! It's almost here! February is officially going to be the time in which, well, the press gets to look at the game. But that means shortly thereafter, in March, which is now a little bit over a month, almost a month away, then we might get into a closed beta event that happens on the weekends. And in April, they're going to open that up to more people, so we are probably... Maybe a little bit... Okay, this news didn't have any major impact on us at all for another two months. <laughs> <laughs> but it's exciting nonetheless. Uh, yeah, basically, news news. we'll see a bunch of press get invited into beta test, beta test events in February, which may or may not be under NDA. They might just be, you know, doing... Uh, pr you know, not, not, we might not see video stuff on it, you know what I'm saying? We might see just sort of uh, articles and previews and stuff come up on, on various websites. I don't know if they're willing to, to let them have, oh yeah, go ahead, put whatever you want. So we'll have to see if that's the case or not. Otherwise, I think everybody's hoping that Total Biscuit gets some awesome new Guild Wars 2 videos up there. Um, and then, of course, April and March, we're gonna, they're going to be ramping up the, uh, the number of people involved, allowing people in the public... What is going on with the birds back here? Man? Background birds. <laughs> yes, they're so loud. That's they saw ridiculous. the they saw overseer cat and start freaking out. I guess so. <laughs> so I apologize for that. Um, when we do make enough money on this show, we'll move to a studio that doesn't include birds. <laughs> All right, but uh, the other interesting points here is something that maybe not everybody saw is a couple of posts by Martin Kirstein uh, from ArenaNet, and I don't know his exact position. I think he's production or 
design PR. And PR. There you go, PR. Yeah, um, PR. But anyway, uh, he made a couple of points to say we purposely didn't use the term open beta. We mentioned beta events. To some people, open beta means unlimited access to the game and everybody on the interwebs can play it. That's not what we're going to do. We are going to do beta weekend events. For those of you who played Guild Wars, you might be familiar with the concept. So that's what we're going to be seeing uh, probably when we actually do get a chance to maybe get in in uh, April or March thereabouts. And then he went on to you know say just purge the term open beta from your from your brain. It's not a terminology that we're using for. It's the wrong one for what we're doing, which makes me is something important because I thought that we'd see February's press. March and April, these beta events, and then we might have an open beta after that, but this seems to imply that no, the beta events are the kind of beta that we've been waiting for. So that's interesting. Maybe we get a May release. Maybe we do. Cross your fingers. Cross your fingers, indeed. All right, so that's pretty much the, the big news, the year of the dragon. Uh, then there's the, the another blog update, two in a row in the same week. It's so exciting. The Savage Pride of the Jotun by Reese Sosby. Did you guys read through this? It's yeah, I actually, I enjoyed that a lot. I mean, I like when they come out with these little lore, lore updates. I'm, I'm a sucker for the little things they release like that, so... Yeah, I'm I'm a huge fan of these. The the Jotun apparently were present in Guild Wars One, and I'm sure Malkior in the channel is going to be. Well, yeah, they were level 16 when you got here, and over here you had level 20 when you get to Eye of the North. So, <laughs> I'm sorry, Malkior. So anyway, uh, the Jotun are essentially a race of sort of giants, though not the giants that were mentioned in uh, the other. Uh, the, the the old, old times that we mentioned in the lore show. These are giants that used to be sort of this great civilization and sort of burned themselves out, which is really interesting. Um, so, uh, Freelancer, tell me what you like most about it. Well, these act as the race that just doesn't give two you-know-whats about anything in life except themselves. And <laughs> they, are, uh, they are essentially the race that... Um, that holds themselves, their pride, and their their strength above all else, and I think that's a great concept. It provides for a um, a great atmosphere where you have to face them because they are just the brutes that will attack you no matter what. There's no negotiating with them, and if they do negotiate, themselves first, and at the first chance they can get a one up on you, so to speak, they will take it. Um, reputation has no hold with them, so. Um, there's a lot of little details about them as well um, that I can't quite recall without going through it again. But I just like the the fact that they act as the the medium in that area. So they're yeah. going to cause a lot of problems, I'm sure, <laughs> for the Shiver Peaks. So. I love the idea, and that's one of the things I really loved about like reading Tolkien is he puts you in this world that has such a rich history that you can really, you know, every time they walk past some monument, like when they go to Weathertop for the first time and Strider's regaling them with the tales of the old, uh, you know, human uh, Numenorean empire. And every time you go past one of these relics, they talk about what was the history here. And that this, this arena net seems to do the same thing. Like, okay, we need some bad guys for this area. And they come up with, okay, they're going to be some kind of giant troll things. And, okay, well, you could go with the everybody else's understanding of giant trolls. It's just like, you know, mindless, I eat things, nom, nom, nom. But instead, they spent the time and effort to go back and really give these guys a massive history. Like, they used to be this great civilization that had magic and culture and religion. And then, through their own behavior, they lost it because they, they just, you know, the, the, the beasts and brutal, brutal, you know, physical, violent part of their society became the one that was more prized amongst the powerful, and so the knowledge was lost, and they still perceive themselves as that mighty empire that they used to be. So, it's it's sad, too, and it's... Oh, it's I, I, I believe we call that immersion. <laughs> I believe we did well, a show if on I that. If I am not mistaken. <laughs> it's not well, immersion. I mean, there's this thing that that like writers and all kinds of people do where they'll like they'll write all kinds or they'll know what this means or something like that but it doesn't necessarily have to be there it's like the idea that you trust whoever's creating the content that they there's like a story behind it and arena just shares a story with you yeah. like they're like here it is you know but, you don't need to know it there may not be a point where you need it but here it is but the backstory for this means they're going to have 
you know, a huge amount of consistency because when you're going into the Shiver Peaks, there are going to probably be things that you see there that sort of are the, you know, what what you might call the Statue of Liberty in the sand at the end of, uh, for example, the, the, the Planet of the Apes. It's like this lost remnant of this ancient society. And it's, in this case, it's going to be of the Jotun, right? You might see some, like, major statue of this huge Jotun, and you're like, wow, these, these barbarians did that? And maybe you don't know the lore, and maybe you learn the lore through a dynamic event. Who knows? But that's just going to be an extra bit of consistency across the world. These things have a backstory, and they the world looks the way it should based on that backstory. So hugely, hugely awesome. If you guys have not read that, highly recommend it. <clears throat> so let's move on to... The PvP Roundtable with ArenaNet. Uh, this was conducted by Guild Wars Insider. We had a little preview of it last week. Uh, and it was pretty freaking awesome, I have to say. Uh, I pulled out some select quotes from here, but, um, I mean, great. This this thing was... The story's in this. Everybody just needs to go read it. <laughs> yeah, it's got a lot of good information. I love the little jokes that ArenaNet threw out, too. Like, they were very candid with it. It wasn't super serious. Uh, and I, I think that's what made it enjoyable that much more. And the way uh, Insider laid it out, too, as far as the formatting, uh, was mm-hmm. really neat, too. I, I liked it. Absolutely. And I've got a link in the show notes if anybody's listening. Just go listen to it if you can because they, they do a great job telling the stories and and, and the, the information and things like that. But often, you know, Seven will ask a question and it'll launch them into a story of this one time when we were playing on this one map and it's just, it's fantastic. But some of the things that, that sort of jumped out at me, uh, they talked about, one of the first questions was about making Guild Wars 2 an eSport. And I just want to quote this whole thing because it's so perfect. Quote, from the beginning we wanted to make an eSport. This is all the way back to four, four years ago. We said we wanted to make an eSport. So we've been watching a lot of different games that have come along and in that time have said, well, what makes a good eSport? Is it fun to play? Is it fun to watch? Is it easy for the average player to come in and pick up on what's going on? End quote. So that is really exciting to me because it's one thing to say when you get to the marketing step that oh yeah we want this thing to be an esport but the fact that they were thinking about this four years ago and that means when they were making laying the groundwork for guild wars 2 this was something that was going into their heads and so they're when they're designing the competitive modes that's coming through their heads um that's very exciting to me i'm very i think i think they're in a very unique position as well because esports are starting to grow rapidly with you know StarCraft and uh, dare I say League of Legends and you know all these other games, so they're in a u- unique position to kind of take and learn what other people have done and really hit the ground running as opposed to trying to build something up. Yeah. So as long as if they could capitalize on it, they're they're going to be in good shape. Anybody else have any any things that jumped out at them while they were reading? Well, I was a, go ahead. Uh, the the idea that or not the idea but like they they were asked a question basically are you gonna have the tools in to like have like casting and stuff like that like that's yeah like that. that's what I was gonna get at and <laughs> they didn't say yes but they said we haven't said anything they dodged it <laughs> they did their, their typical answer like like oh yeah we haven't said anything but we're thinking about they it. They said we have we're plans. Like, we're, we're planning. We're thinking. We're, I, so I means- think they have something in the works, but they can't guarantee that it's going to be there for launch, so they're, they're not saying that it, that it, anything about it. Because if they say anything about it and then it's not ready for launch, people are just going to be like, you said there was going to be this. And yeah, so, I mean, it's just a smart move not to say anything if you don't know for sure that something's going to be there. But the fact that they've still kind of confirmed, yes, we want to do this, is at least, you know, Somewhat reassuring. Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, they're going to put it in eventually, especially if they combine Guild Wars 2 with the term eSport. I mean, that's just mm-hmm. part of it. Yeah. So, it'll come. I think if it's not in at launch, it's going to be one of their super priority things to get in shortly thereafter. Based on uh, what, what I'm so- hearing here. Let's not, have, let's that not have that debate again. All right. <laughs> so, this, I feel like this is familiar. Which we show did. is that? One, two? I think <laughs> it might have been the big PvP show, uh, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. But uh, Go watch that show if you haven't. <laughs> so they did have a few discussions about World vs. World and the massive trebuchet that's going to be available there. They said, you know, that, you know that trebuchet? This is paraphrasing. You know that trebuchet that's in the Battle of Kylo? 
He's baby compared to this thing that's in the world versus world. <laughs> that <laughs> Kylo is baby. Fight. <laughs> so they mentioned that, you know, while you can dodge out of the radius of a Kylo trebuchet explosion, you won't be able to do that in world versus world. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of exciting. And the siege suits. Did you read the part about the siege suits? Yeah. That was so funny. It's like, we don't want battering rams. We want you to jump in like a machine and go bang on the a, door. A that's that's a way to get it down. It's one of those golems that the Azura have, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a giant version, though, which sounds really cool. <laughs> that's, uh, why, that's why I was making the Azura. The there's battle. a link in the show notes. Somebody's asking in the thing where you can read the chat room. There you go. That should – oh, of course, it's a stupid Google link, but it should work. Um, so uh, let's see here. What else did I see? Oh, I thought this was really interesting. They had mentioned um, – I don't remember exactly what the question was, but they were talking about variants for, for PvP, and they said, uh, I just don't really know if there's been variants that were just insane. CTF was kind of – and then somebody else jumps in. We prototyped a bunch of different maps and a bunch of different play styles. So that implies that – you know, people have been asking, how come there's only Conquest? Why is there only Conquest? And I think it's because they tried a lot of different options for the competitive PvP modes. And they just chose Conquest because it was the best and they wanted to focus on it. Now, the fact that they've already prototyped a bunch of others means we might see those sooner than, rather than later after the game comes out. Which is going to be interesting. But, if I, you know, it's kind of a confirmation. Yes, we didn't just start with Conquest. We prototyped and actually played CTF and a bunch of other modes. And there goes a bird. It okay. just flew out. <laughs> yes. It was. I, I think uh, I think what a lot of gamers are going to realize, Guild Wars Two fans, is that they're they're adding so many options with Conquest that um, it, it's going to be one of those that it'll cover so many modes from other games just in that one mode. You know, because you can set up custom games. You can set up whether you want one versus one or all the way up to I think they said what eight versus eight or ten versus ten. I think ten versus ten so, is the max. I in mean, the so mode. you could have those large scale and small scale battles all within this one conquest mode. You can set all the settings you like. I believe you can even pick specific maps you want to play. So, I mean, it, I think what a lot of people are going to realize is that with all the different maps, you can play that type that you want to play. It's not just one type of mode. It's a very customizable one type of mode. Yep, yep. So I'm, I, and plus the maps are all going to have their own little gimmicks. We got trebuchets and destructible terrain. Maybe we got some kind of lightning storm that randomly kills people on another... Okay, no. <laughs> The gimmicks table. Now here's a story I just got to relate. I love what they were talking about with the Mesmer and what the Mesmer can do in a map. <clears throat> um, they said... Uh, Oh, there's one time I was playing against someone and had like 10% health, and I ran around a corner and as they were chasing me. I was able to pop off some illusions quickly. As they rounded the corner, I just stood still. I started very slowly pushing my number one skill like my other illusions were doing. They were like, wait, which one of these is the real one? Then I switched my weapon set and was invisible for three seconds. With those three seconds, I was able to make it back around another corner. So he talked about using it as a distraction. But then he said... Behaving like your illusions fools people. However, these guys are really good at spamming AOE, so you can't really keep illusions up. <laughs> because that's the counter to illusions. Now, I think it's important to point out that what he points out here is that if you sort of equip yourself to be able to spam AOE, that is a disadvantage if you're fighting somebody one-on-one, -on -one, and then the only spells that you have are AOE spells, which theoretically are not as effective as single target spells, right? Theoretically. Theoretically. So I think yeah. that's kind of an interesting rock, paper, scissor kind of thing going on there. Well, one question I have, and this was always a big debate in WoW before they added it, is is there a damage cap on AoEs? If I am running a world versus world group, and I got my 30 guys clumped up in a little tiny ball, let's say a Mesmer throws an invisibility field, right? <laughs> and, we're, and we're all clumped up in this little tiny ball, and Elementalist comes around and casts Meteor Shower. Is that going to hit all of my 30 guys for full damage, or is that going to cap off at a certain point? That's something I would like to know eventually, but um, hmm. that's, that's what it's going to come down to. Because imagine that if an AoE does full damage, and there are some MMOs where it would do full damage, and all of a sudden numbers would fill up your screen, and you know, you'd insta-kill 30 people, but um, <laughs> um, say, I mean, a trebuchet, we can imagine if that trebuchet hits a group of people, they're all dead, right? But does the same apply for classes? That's my question. That's a good question. Maybe we'll learn about that when we get, uh, get access. 
We shall see. All right. <clears throat> so a uh, bunch of other good stuff in there. There was a crazy story about how they, they had a game where they were down like 499. And the goal was obviously to get to 500. They were down 499 to 300. And they managed to come all the way back and win 500 to 499. This just, oh, it's so great. If you haven't listened to it, go listen to it. Uh, it's not worth spending more time on here because it's, it's just great to listen to itself. So that having been said... Um, I think it's time for me to uh, try to get it out. Get out all of my rage, all of my anger. Because, you know, when I get angry, when I get upset, I got a vent. And when I vent, it's called a Bridger rant. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, here, I was reading the Guild Wars 2 Guru forums, and now Kior can also understand this. In that thread in which they were talking about the beta access and the fact that press are going to get access to it in February, and then later on it's going to be open to more people, but not everybody. I see someone by the name of Arrow. Arrow, how are you doing, my good friend? I don't judge him at all until I start reading his post. And he says, I think it's a bit dodgy to give the press priority access. Really? You think a company that's trying to market their game shouldn't be giving the press priority access. Do you ever read PC Gamer? Do you ever go to Joystick? How do you think they get the information that you read? They have priority access. They don't just go to a website and get access to the game the same way you can. They get priority access because they are the ones that are helping to market the game. Bit dodgy. That's just, that's how the entire game industry has worked forever. I can't even, okay, fine, whatever. He wants to get it, I'll let... But then he says, It's a bit unfair that you're going to prevent people from playing in the preview weekends. Are you kidding me? It's a bit unfair that I can't play your game before it's released. That's unfair to me personally. The sense of entitlement is too damn high. That's what I... I just... It's blowing my mind here. It's too many people. They're going to not get in the beta, and they're going to go, This is bullshit. I'm going to call a arena net. They, they're never playing a game by them again. I couldn't get into the beta. And you know it's not true. You know it's not true. They're going to play the game. as soon. They're going to buy it. They already pre-ordered that game months ago, and they're not... They're just words. Words are wind. And I'm spent. All right. So... Bridger got trolled. <laughs> wow. I don't think so. I think I think that was a legitimate response. I just didn't type it out. There's nothing wrong with that. <clears throat> so, I guess now it's time to roll up our sleeves and dig our hands into the mailbag. Because there were a lot of feedback from last week's competitive versus casual show. I don't know if you guys noticed. <laughs> but there yeah, was a lot yeah, of people <laughs> with agreements and disagreements. And there was a lot of slight misunderstandings, too, which I wanted to correct. But uh, So let's actually uh, jump into that now. Somebody, uh, let's see who this, FFF12321 <laughs> says... There have been exploits that allowed the duplication of items, for example. Doing so crashes the market. That item is now practically worthless, etc. And somebody else said, uh, you know, further your definition of griefing victory conditions that are not everybody else's cuts out particular types of players that are not griefing, like this guy who wants to just see the lore of the game. Um, I, I should clarify that when we were talking about, you know, whether you, you do or do not use exploits in the previous show, what we were talking about was in sort of a competitive gaming Mindset. So in the competitive PvP mode of Guild Wars 2, for example, is what we're talking about here. Obviously, whether you use an exploit in the open world against the computer AI or you use it to destroy the market is a, has different ramifications in it and a completely different topic than what we were talking about last week. I don't think anybody in the show here thinks it's okay to have, just duplicate all the items because you can, if you had that option. Um, I think that would probably be bad. So... Uh, uh, that, I think, is an, is an important thing to make. Um, Monster just recently read, left a, a note here on, my, uh, on, on, the, on the Tales of Terry website. And he said, I th quote, I think that the pro player forgot his name. I think he's talking about you, Freelancer. Brought up a, and he said pro player, which makes <laughs> Thanks, it buddy. just turn the screw. <laughs> 
<laughs> brought up a good point about using exploits and morality choices. Using 100 sonic booms may not be an exploit, but it is cheap in my opinion. To be honest, I couldn't respect a win in that manner, whether it's Street Fighter, Battlefield, or any other game slash sport. It takes away from the win when done in a cheap manner. For myself. I'm speaking for myself because it's a personal choice not to use cheap tricks or play styles to win. Being deep down, if I need to abuse a system against someone in order to win, the other player has already won at the end of the day. <clears throat> now, I really want to field this one, but uh, is there anybody else that thinks they could take it? Go ahead. I've been talking too I, long. I, uh, I mean, what I, like, I think everyone hates it. I, I'm just going to talk about Street Fighter in terms of the whole <laughs> cheap sonic booms and stuff, and that you know, when you first start playing Street Fighter and you die to that one person who just sits in the corner doing that over and over, yeah, it sucks. It sucks so bad. And then at, you just at the end of the day, you have to realize that it's it's part of the game. It's cheap and it sucks. But if you just get angry about it, it's you're just gonna get angry about it. There's nothing you could do about it. It's not an exploit. It's not anything. It's just cheap. And it's just it's you have to take it up and try and find something that'll beat them. It'll make you, in the end, it'll make you a better gamer if you find a way to kind of beat that person who's being cheap. So, to me, and this is coming from agreeing with David Serlin's view of, of gaming and competitive gaming, there's no such thing as cheap. You can't define cheap in any real definitive um, way. To me, cheap is in the eye of the beholder, which means it's a sort of effusive thing, which doesn't make any sense. But what his example of using 100 sonic booms is cheap, and I, wouldn't, I couldn't respect somebody for winning in that manner. Now, I'm going to use that exact argument, and I'm, gonna, and, and I'm just going to try to logically apply it to the game of chess, and we're going to see how far it goes. So I am playing this game, and to me, using the queen is too cheap, because it's way too easy to win if you use the queen. So I don't respect other people who use the queen. I just leave my queen back at the base, and I try to win with the real pieces that actually are have take skill to use. And to me, that is the only way to play. It, it's, it's, it's stupid, because the queen just goes anywhere she wants, right? I mean, that just makes it way too easy. So that's queen's too so cheap. OP. Yeah, the queen's OP, <laughs> clearly. So I think when you take it and you look at it in that way, it's clear that the... The problem with things like Sonic Booms is not that they're, they're cheap, I guess you could say. The problem is that people either perceive them to be um, basically breaking the game or forcing the game into a degenerate and shallow state, and therefore the game would be better without them, or they basically are wrong and those things have counters but they are not yet good enough to use those counters do not know those counters so in the case of 100 sonic booms any pro player is going to be able to get out of that trap any very expert player i should say sorry freelancer any expert <laughs> player is going to be able to get out of that trap even any high level mid player is going to be able to get out of that trap by saying that 100 sonic booms is cheap what he's saying is i'm not very good at this game and I don't like it when people use a move I haven't figured out how to counter yet. And to me, that's just keeping him capped as a player. He's not able to extend past that spot. But let's say if instead he figures out how to beat that particular 100 Sonic Booms in a row, then he now knows the counter to the 100 Sonic Booms in a row. And his opponent has to figure out a counter to the counter. And then you had a much deeper game because both sides are trying to get in the other's head and figure out which one's going to do this move next. And so I don't think 100 Sonic Boobs in a row is a problem. Did I say 100 Sonic Boobs? <laughs> I think I might have said Sonic Boobs. Um... <laughs> So I would, I would recommend he go read David Serlin's book because that kind of was an eye-opener for me, and I think that he kind of eviscerates the idea of cheap in games. Um, and I think the chess example is a really good one. Here's one I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to field to you guys. How do you think teams will work differently from pugs, like pickup groups, just random people thrown together, in both five versus five competitive modes and in world versus world? So, you know, you're thrown together with a bunch of people. Obviously, you want to work together uh, versus... Working together, being on Team Speaker or some kind of or Roger Wilco, uh, you know, or something to that effect. How does that change things? Great. Well, it, it changes a lot of things, and I'm going to use Dota 2 for an example here because I'm watching a lot of stuff on it because I'm trying to learn a lot. And there's a distinction between people who are really good at the game. They say there's a difference between pub games 
in actual like games. So there's things like they say in a pub match you can do this, and it would be it's cool and it works, and you can get away with it. But in a competitive match, like an actual important thing, like a I don't know what tournament or whatever tournament game, you can't do that. So there's definitely some distinctions in like difference between public and pugs and teams that played with each other a lot. Yeah, there's definitely going to be a difference. Um, uh, freelancer, what what can you see happening? I mean, is there going to be closer working together? Because we already know there's not going to be any any audio, any any VoIP in game. We're going to have to have it externally. I mean, what you're basically discussing is kind of what I think guilds are focused around. That's organizing. Uh, it's it's much compared to uh, let's say the Roman Legion going up against the example you're talking about a group of people that are organized have developed tactics and strategies beforehand going up against a bunch of riffraff that are being led by a guy with a big mouth you know and um there there could be a shining example there but it's still a bunch of people that are following just for the sake of following and they don't really have a set goal they're just following that guy because he's cool or he's well known um that organized group if they're truly organized will always conquer so i think in world versus world um, arenas, anybody who's played WoW, you, you know what I'm talking about. Um, it's If you set up the t- tactics beforehand, if you're learning from your mistakes, if you're developing um, those different skill sets that you should be, uh, pugs aren't going to matter. I mean, you'll have 100 guys that will continually roll through every pug they come across. And it's only because they communicate, number one. I mean, what are you, how are you going to communicate in a pug? You're going to type it out, right? In the midst of all of that going on? No. You can't tell me that's efficient. And um, so I think I think if uh, the organized groups in World versus World and pertaining to that question, and Angerina wrote that, right? Yes. Uh, love you, Angerina. Um, I, I think it's important that not only they work together, but they consistently work together to develop a history and reputation with each other. Those will be the servers that you see leading the charts. So <clears throat> what I was thinking is we're definitely going to see a lot tighter and more coordinated, like, uh, multi-class, cross-class combos and things like that. Like, we might even see situations where, okay, we just got a ton of conditions dumped on us as a group. Like, AoE, like, Mesmer just shattered, and now we've got conditions all over the place. Okay, so execute, you know, Alpha Strike B or whatever, and then the Warrior does his thing, and then the Elementus does this thing, and we do some cross-class combo that removes you know, conditions in an AOE. Like, we know there's some kind of thing that does that. So there are certain things that are going to be accessible to groups of people that if you know about them and you can communicate fast enough, like on VoIP, you can just say, all right, warrior, quick, you know, do this, or elementalist, give me an ice field, and then, bam, you get them together instantly whenever you need them and done. Whereas if you're in a pickup group, you can't make those kind of communications ideas. I mean, maybe... I could realize as the elementalist that we need this thing and I can drop an ice field and hope that the warrior also realizes this is something that we could really use right now and switches to the right weapon and does the thing. But unless it's something that you've practiced and communicated with over VoIP, those kinds of interactions are much harder. Mostly people are fighting by themselves, which is going to be, uh, you know, not, not nearly as interesting <laughs> for all intents and purposes. So yeah, so, I ho- I hope that World versus World spurs a new MMO genre of people that want to encourage that social aspect. I really do because you, you think about it, they're developing all these different ways to communicate with your guild and your server via your iPhone now and your iPad. And I, I hope that this, like, one year from now, that Facebook is, I mean, is like. Or we'll say Guild Wars 2 is like another Facebook. You'll be logging on to get the latest updates, to download or look at the latest strategies for your guild. I mean, it sounds a little dirty, sounds a little geeky, but I think it'll become so second nature, or I hope so, for a lot of players later on. Yep. Let's not go that far. Because <laughs> there's some, I there's hope some it goes scary that far. stuff on Facebook. Let's, let's, go to the, let's go to, like, the doorway and, like, re- relax there for a minute. Yeah. Let's just not go all the way. Yeah, because that could be bad, bad. <laughs> Let's not fall off the edge of Facebook social networking dumb. Uh, yeah. Not yet. So let me see. What else we got here? Um, Are we? Could I? Can I throw something? Go about ahead. The whole go ahead. Pugs? I'm looking for the next question, but go ahead. So, um, I guess I, I guess you started off with, um, you know, the whole point of these games is teamwork, and I think that that's why pegs 
pugs will always fail against an organized team because there's always that one guy who wants to get more kills or wants to capture more points and wants to go off on his own as opposed to working with the mm -hmm. team. So, you know, when, when we're talking about games like League of Legends and Dota, you know, in pugs, you're going to have people who, you know, you're not communicating. So it almost has to become intuitive as to how you help each other. And then the, it falls apart when you get that one person or those two people who want to do their own thing. Um, but when it comes to world versus world, we're talking about, you know, huge scale battles and, you know, what, what, what's the limit? It's up, upwards of 500. Yeah. So 500 on 500. Um, and without a doubt in my mind, organized groups are always going to win. But <laughs> at the end of the day, who's going to have a guild of 500 people? Well, it's probably and 250 by 250 because it's 500 per map. So I might have been confused. Um, <clears throat> that actually brings up a really interesting point in that I remember reading a, a thread in the, the Guru um, that had a discussion going on about how Guild Wars 2 was going to compare to FPS games, for example. And, they, and somebody pointed out that TF2 – or maybe, no, this is on Reddit actually – TF2 – is a very different kind of first-person shooter than something like Modern Warfare Counter-Strike is. In Modern Warfare Counter-Strike, a single person can carry the whole team on his back. Like, really completely. If he does and gets the headshots at the right time, he can kill every other player on the other team one after another, right? But in TF2, if a soldier goes up against a scout, and, you know, the scout has any decent skills at all, the soldier is going to be down at half health or something, even if he kills the scout. And then when he goes up against the next the next enemy, like a soldier or whatever, now he's going to have a much higher hill. At the very least, maybe he's going to get two kills. Maybe he's going to get three kills. But in no way is he going to get four, five, or six kills unless he gets a critical rocket or something crazy like that. So as a general rule, in TF2, it's all about teamwork and how you work together. Same kind of thing in League of Legends. One person can be really badass if they're fed in League of Legends, but in general, in most games, people are trying to coordinate so that they CC the right people at the right time and drop the ults when the enemy is all in an AoE tight circle and things like that and that guild wars is not going to be like the counter-strike example where one person can just go around and kill everybody one after another and just carry the team it's going to be more like team fortress 2 where there has to be a lot of you're, it's going to be a lot about teamwork the team that works together better is going to be more important than the team that just has simply one super awesome player and I, and I feel that it, it, there's more to it than that because it's also, in terms of how successful a pug can be, is that how intuitive is it to figure out the combos and figure mm -hmm. out what your role is as what you're playing? Because, you know, in League of Legends, if you're a support, you know what you got to do. If you're a tank, you know what you got to do. It's easy to kind of get into the groove, and if you want to help your team out, it's easy to figure that out. That's why TF2 is successful is because... Oh man, we're having a really hard time pushing all these sentries. Well, someone turn to a medic and get an Uber charge, and then we'll go in there. You know, so it's it's intuitive as to what you have to do. Right. And so, for well, all right, maybe for not for everyone, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I guess I should have uh, rephrased that. But yeah, I mean, if if it's hard to say now without actually playing the game and seeing more videos, but how intuitive is it going to be to figure out what your, your role is? I think instead of the roles like healer, tank, you know, that you would expect in an MMO, I think it's going to be more so like we need these guys on trebuchet, we need these guys on the front door, we need these guys yeah. in the siege weapons, you know. So it, it's a different scenario, but you still the, – the difference between pugs and organize, organized groups is going to be we know our role before we get there, and the pugs are going to be like, well, I don't feel like doing that. Well, who feels like doing it? Well, uh, well, he can do it. Well, I've never done it before. And <laughs> you, just, you just run into a big problem. There's, um, let me try to remember the quote here. Um, there's a quote from Sun Tzu. Uh, Victorious uh, warriors go to uh, win first and then go to war, while defeated warriors go to war and then seek to win. Um, you and played I think a lot a of very... Civilization Four, also, I see. Well, no, I'm a big fan <laughs> of Sun Tzu, but um, Art of War, if any of you uh, guys listening to this, uh, The Art of War by Sun Tzu is a great book for these kind of discussions, but the, the concept applies that unless you plan out things beforehand, the, the organized group, no matter what the scenario might be, League of Legends, TF2, or otherwise, they will always, unless by some crazy chance that the enemy team gets a bunch of crit rockets, Bridger. 
<laughs> they will always they will always lose. You know, actually, and Bones brings up a point, good point. I'm not trying to say that Counter Strike or Modern Warfare things don't require teamwork. I'm just saying that in those games, a really good player can, because of the way that the game works, in in those kinds of games, the health pool is really small. You can kill somebody in basically one shot if you hit him in the head, right, or or you know, a small burst. Whereas it, the 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 fights in TF2 and the fights in Guild Wars 2 are going to be lasting longer, and the health pools are larger, so you can't just insta kill people because you're really good and then move on and insta-kill the next person without any real detriment to your ability. In Guild Wars 2, after a fight with somebody, even if you're really good, you're going to have taken some damage, usually, and that means that you're going to be less effective in the next fight unless you get some backup, unless you take some time to heal. So, anyway, that's all I was trying to say there. I wasn't trying to say that Counter-Strike doesn't take teamwork, because obviously it does. Um, so here's one more question here from Mr. Jokey. He says, in regards to exploits, abuse, and bugs as you define them, how would you look at multiboxing? By multiboxing, I mean the use of five characters player on several machines, overpowering more or less anything in their wake. I remember running across a shaman multibox in Alteric Valley on our side, and it was clear that the Alliance players couldn't counter that. And when they finally did, it took so many players to bring that box down that they lost territory to the other side. So my question is, is multiboxing an abuse? Is it that exploiting? What would you consider it? Anybody want to jump on this one? I have a story about this. All right. In, on the server I played in WoW, in Wrath, Wrath of Lich King, there, in uh, Wintergrass, there was this guy who was infamous at, of appearing only during this time, like 10 minutes before the battle was about to start. His name was Prepared. He was like 40 shamans <laughs> on one guy, and he would just like chain lightning, and everyone would die, and we wouldn't be able to stop him. So, like, multiboxing sucks if you're fighting against it. And really what it comes down to is, is it abuse or not? It's up to what the, um, the game company says. It's going to be up to what ArenaNet says. If ArenaNet says it's okay, it's going to be fine with them. Blizzard well, has like, I, said it's okay. I, there, if there's one word I would use to describe multiboxing, and it is sad. Someone who wants to, especially with something like WoW, someone who wants to pay for five accounts, 40 accounts, or whatever, to just do that is just sad. And I don't know I think, if I would call it sad. I mean, that's, that's an interesting challenge. I mean, if somebody says, hey, I wonder if I can do this, and gets together I, well, okay. all that stuff to be able to do I'm it, not, that's I'm kind not, of cool I'm, that they can do it. I mean, really. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about the, the skills involved in controlling all that stuff. I'm talking about it's sad, the amount of money that person is paying just to essentially troll people. I think we can assume that whoever's doing that probably has the money to spare. <laughs> well, let me, let me give you a counterpoint to that. Let me give you a counterpoint. I multiboxed in EVE Online, and my multiboxing paid for my accounts. I never paid a dime out of my pocket. Ah. And as far as griefing other players, I mean, I, I had three miners and a frigate that defended those miners, and I was in, in high-sec areas, and... Um, never entered PvP with it. Uh, I don't think multiboxing, anybody that multiboxes can effectively control more than one character as well as if they practiced with a solo character mm -hmm. in most scenarios. Now, when you got a third-party program helping you in such case with the shamans, um, then that's a different story entirely because then it's not you doing it. It's You have this third party, which is against the, the EULA agreement, um, program basically copying the keystrokes to each you know, tabbed program. So yeah. that's a different story. Now, if somebody's legitimately running two keyboards, legitimately running two programs, and somehow I would love to meet them. That's that's a prodigy there. But that's a whole different story entirely. I think multiboxing shouldn't be allowed on in MMOs such as Guild Wars. But when you're playing a game like EVE, uh, I'm sorry, but if, if unless you're PvPing in EVE, I mean... It's redundant anyway. At least multiboxing. <laughs> <laughs> At least multiboxing for me allowed me to focus my ADD on something. You know. <laughs> I I I gotta think, and this this is something I've always kind of thought, is that the fact that all you have to do is copy keystrokes just goes to show you that it seems to me the how to put this gently. The skill ceiling in WoW 
is just not that high. Like, the physical skill and the input skill and what you need to do in order to play the game is not that high. Now, the knowledge base, the decision tree in WoW is pretty high because you've got a ton of different things you can do at any one moment, especially, like, Rogue, you can do six different types of, you know, escapes and invisibles and how you close, blah, blah, blah. But just, if you can play the game with five characters all simultaneously, imagine trying to do that with Counter-Strike. You couldn't do it. Because Counter-Strike has a much more skill-based input infrastructure. And I'm hoping that Guild Wars 2 gets closer to that more skill-based input infrastructure to where multi-boxing isn't even really possible. I mean, how do you... You're, you're going you're gonna to drain all of your dodges because one person fires at one of your boxes. That doesn't sound like a very good plan. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you try to play with just have five players running around in Guild Wars 2, I can't imagine it would be nearly as efficient as it is in World of Warcraft. Well, tell me what you think about this, Bridger. What if... Uh someone were to multi-box a character that is doing all the PvP, is doing all the content, and then has a second character that is doing all of the, um, let's say, auction house stuff, you know, all the economy stuff. Maybe that character is crafting nonstop. Would you consider that unfair or unbalanced? Yeah. Yeah. No? A lot of people would, and I mean, it goes both ways, but um, I mean, the official stance for Guild Wars 1 and and WoW now even is uh, you can't just you can't use third party programs. Right. So and that, that every, I, I approve, of course. Yeah, and so uh, the demographics uh, of the polls that were done on it, it most people actually use their multi box accounts just for that. Uh, and I and I got to admit, I thought about doing it at one time because I like doing the auction house game. I love the economy aspect of things, and um, it's a. Uh, I mean, you got to imagine it's viable. You could stay out doing quests while you have another character that's receiving your mailbox doing your work. But hey, didn't they other... implement that directly into <laughs> Star Wars? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. yeah. yeah they so. All right, <clears throat> so let's uh, let's move on, shall we? We don't have a real round table like we must talk about all this in super depth for this week, but um, uh, we we have what I'd like to call table scraps. There are a couple of threads. Uh, uh, one on Reddit and one on Guild Wars 2 Guru talking about the size of health pools. Now, anybody who's played WoW anytime recently and you got past level 70, uh, you would know <laughs> that the the numbers in your health pool are out of control. They're not just over 9,000. They're over 900,000. <laughs> <laughs> and the damage numbers are just as big. And it's really ridiculous trying to see what the hell's going on. Now, I don't know if this is possible, but they probably, somebody out there has made an add-on that removes, like, the first th the three digits of every number in World of Warcraft, because you don't care about those. They're so small in, in comparison to the full number. You just don't need them. So somebody points out that you've got, like, yeah, 20,000, 30,000 HP in Guild Wars 2, based on what we've seen. Now, we've not seen max level. So, I mean, we've seen somewhere around, you know, sixteen to 20,000 in, in some of those examples, I think. Um, actually, we have seen max level in PvP, so I think it's around that number. That's still yeah. really high. What do you guys think? Because Guild Wars 1 had really low health numbers. I think it's one of those things that we talked about the, the mental, the, the brain chemistry when you mm -hmm. see, you know, something like those big numbers. I think that's uh, it's sort of gimmicky, but I mean, does it really make a difference? Not really. I think UI I mean, wise, it's much easier to read that you've done 100 damage than it is to read that you've done 10,000 damage, for example. You know, I'd rather just, you know, be able to move the decimal point at will, like if that's an option in my UI. If I could just say, okay, I want to see the discrete numbers right now because I'm doing some tests to see how this build works, then I can move the decimal point all the way out and see every number. But otherwise, I can move all the decimal points over three spaces and just care about those first three numbers because everything else after the decimal point doesn't really matter. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, some. I mean, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Um, no, yeah, I mean, I think it's just if it's all. It's all just a number game, and it, it, I, to me, if, it's, if, if it makes the gameplay better in terms of, you know, like you were saying, it's easier to read 100 damage as opposed to 10,000 damage. Um, but I, I feel that having those huge health pools, it's just, I guess it's, it's unnecessary in most situations, I think. Yeah, I mean, 16 to 20k is not... That's, that's not huge. That's not ridiculous like WoW has gotten to. It'll be easy enough to read when you do 1,000 damage or, you know, 1,500 damage. But, you know, you just don't need that last space. I think three numbers is, or maybe four numbers is really enough. 
It's just to make you feel that much more badass. I mean, what about the other thing is if, if you have everything in percentages? That would be another very interesting way of displaying it. Like, if, obviously, these should be options. I, I don't think any of them are f- fantastic for any specific thing, like all things, for example. Uh, but, you know, if, you, if it shows you, okay, you just did 6% of his, you know, total health in damage, or, you, you know, you have 6% left or something like that. I mean, that's not nearly as useful as, as just moving the decimal point over because different classes have different numbers of health. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I'd like the percentage one. Percentages wouldn't work on like an RPG system at all. Yeah, because there'd be no growth. Like you're 100 percent, 100 percent, 100 percent. Yes, <laughs> your health. It's not gonna go. Your health it's went from 100 percent to 100 percent. It's, <laughs> but I just would love to have the option to be able to move the decimal point and then just drop the drop everything after the decimal point. So I, I think I the only thing they add. I think the only thing that really matters in the long run is like the scale of the health. Does it take? You know, if okay, if we're gonna have 30k health, I mean, is does that mean it's gonna take that much longer to kill somebody, or is it just scaled up in terms just the number? Whereas damage is also scaled up with it. You know, and while during the latest expansions they scaled up the HP, but not so much the damage. I think that was that was a move in the Um, because now battles between. Paladin and Paladin are just that much more worse. So, <laughs> I mean, it's it's uh yeah. So they they scaled up the HP by almost two hundred, three hundred percent. Where your warriors now have an insane amount of HP, but the damage and the attributes that go with that did not scale up that much. So now, the idea is that now it's more of a grind in PvP. You know, it's more of a, they're trying to make it more of an epic battle between two classes, but um. It's uh, I I just don't I don't like it. I've watched a lot of videos. I even played around with it a little bit. It's just protracting the battle to me is just it does it gets rid of the the strategy elements of it because now it's just a matter of who can pop more potions or heals and, um, and the same goes with Guild Wars too. I mean, if they're gonna have 30k HP, I would expect my attacks to do a similar amount of damage so that if I do cast 10 fireballs, whether they have 100 HP or 30,000 HP, those 10 fireballs metaphorically would kill them just the same mm-hmm. that that would if they do that that's fine i don't care if you have 300,000 hp as long as my fireball still kills you in the same <laughs> right exactly i'm only considering the the ui element how easy is it to read as a player in the middle of a fight and that's why i think it would be nice if it was an option like you could just decide you know okay i just want to eliminate the first you know, two or three or four digits and, and have that on a slider you could change at any time. Because when I'm in the middle of combat, the only numbers that are going to matter to me are like the first three in like a, a you know, a, a five-digit number. But the uh, when I'm outside of combat, I'm maybe testing something out, trying to see how effective this new trait is. I might want to have every decimal available to me to see how it works. So anyway, I, I just think that's an, that was, was an interesting discussion, so I thought I'd bring it up. You know, if we uh, in Guild Wars 2, if we just see that option in the in the UI menu, we're going to point at Bridger and say, like, I thought of that first. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to see an option in there just for you, Bridger. It says scale damage right there. Well, maybe I popularized so. it, but as I pointed out, these these ideas and concepts came from these oh, yeah, other two yeah. threads. I don't want to take credit. It's yeah. not my fault. <laughs> All right, so lastly, let's go to one more piece of table scraps here. Gaming controls and peripherals. How will you control Guild Wars 2? Let me ask anybody on the panel here. Does anybody use anything, any special gaming peripherals like Nostromo or something like that? Uh, I have a Nostromo. I used it in WoW when I played WoW. How'd you like it? It it was really, really, really awkward to use at first. I mean, really awkward. Going from like a keyboard mouse... Ah, oh, Naga. Going from a keyboard, <laughs> ma- ma- keyboard and mouse to like a Naga and mouse is—I mean, not Naga and mouse. Now I'm getting confused. Thanks, freelancer. Uh, from uh, <laughs> to uh, Nostromo, it's a huge change. But then you get used to it, and things sort of feel like they're more efficient. It's not that it feels better; it feels more efficient. Like, oh, I'm hitting things better, better faster. Okay. Anybody else have any experience with uh, things like the Nostromo, which, if you, in case you're not aware, it's basically a replacement for the left-hand side of your keyboard, specifically for gaming. Um, it gives you the WASD keys and a bunch of other keys around it, and also gives you more controls for your thumb to move and things like that. And I'll put a, a picture of it in the show notes so that you guys can, uh, can see it there. Uh, but it, it, there are specific peripherals that are designed to replace the keyboard side of your keyboard and mouse setup in order to make it more efficient, more useful, things like that. Anybody else have any experience? Did you ever try that, uh, uh, Freelancer? 
I, I have a Nostromo, but I use that for uh, gaming events, like when I go out to tournaments and such. Um, it's just it's far more convenient. You can put it on your lap. Um, it's mine's packed up, but you can put it on your lap and essentially have your mouse and a mouse pad. I have I have Razer everything, it's, um, mm -hmm. but it's uh, with those two things. You don't have to have a keyboard sitting there, which is typically bulky. You can have your monitor set up in front of you. Um, it's convenient now for practical use, like sitting at a keyboard. Not really, unless you have the key uh, desk set up, you can do it. Like uh, kind of spin my webcam around here, but I mean, I use a variety of different things. I have. Um, a program on my droid that sits on a dock that gives me real-time information on the games I play. I have obviously my all my macros set up on my Razer keyboard and the Naga. Now the question is, all of that being said and more, is that necessary to be a good gamer? No, not not at all. Does it make it more efficient? Yes, by far. Anybody that owns a Naga um, knows once you get used to it how much faster it is. Because imagine right now, a typical mouse. Everybody hold up their mouse. Um, what is your right thumb doing right now? What is it able to do? Um, chances are nothing. It, it may have one button there. It may have two buttons there if you have like a G9 or something. But when do you actually use that thumb? And chances are you never do. So the, the idea with an Astramo and quote unquote and, um, and the Naga is that it gives you total control of those, of those fingers and the things you don't normally do. I mean, even on the Naga, um, a lot of people don't realize it is you got not only the full full numerical pad there. buttons. Yeah, you got the twelve buttons there. And for somebody like myself who has a, a WoW, who has played WoW and had a UI with like fifty keys there, okay, yeah. or fifty little things on your UI. Now, thankfully, Guild Wars Two will not be like that. But in WoW, as you can imagine, the Naga allows you to place all that on there, and it made it very useful. So you don't have to do Control F one or Control whatever it might be, or Alt to access those other ones. You can save that for other things. Um, so it, it has a place, but it, it's not going to make you a programmer. I mean, even your top StarCraft programmers right now, uh, they do have a ton of hotkeys, or your top uh, Counter-Strike, which is a bad example, but all of your top programmers right now, chances are they're not using a Naga. I also have a Diamondback. I have uh, Lachesis. I have a few others. But it, um, it's, it's all going to come down to your natural aptitude with the mouse um, more so than the button so don't go but just because you're listening to this podcast don't go out buying a naga thinking it's going to make you a great gamer it's not but when you do get at that level and you think that you could use a little bit extra edge um, then yeah definitely consider getting one it'll, it'll speed up your uh, your hotkey times for sure that's my that's my rant there you go <laughs> <laughs> so i don't have a naga but i do have a g700 i always like the logitech ones and it does have four buttons on the thumb, which I find is enough because that's all my spells in League of Legends, which is kind of nice. And then it's got three up top. The mouse, of course, has the left and right, and then you can click it and do whatever. And uh, so I find I find that I really like this mouse a lot. I never really got any into using anything for the left-hand side, like the Nostromo or anything like that. Um, I, I did try one, and I put a link to it in the chat there. There's Strategic Command, the Microsoft Strategic Command, which was... Uh, supposed to be basically a replacement for your keyboard when you're playing like RTS games because the whole thing swivels so you could use your arm to move the screen. Like in, if you're playing, you know, Warcraft 3, for example, you could use your arm to move the screen and then you had, I think, eight programmable buttons, two under each of your fingers, and then your thumb had three buttons and then you can also switch in profiles and all kinds of other things. The problem I had with that was that when I tried to move it left and right and forward and back to move the screen, the whole thing would slide on my desk. It didn't really have a very good rubber bottom, so the whole <laughs> thing was just crap. And I gave up after a fashion. Well, see, anybody taking competition seriously, when you get to the, the Nostrama, I mean, some people have them, they swear by them and stuff. Those are also the same people that will claim they're pro or they're, they're extremely skilled. Chances are you can just laugh at them because when you actually get to these tournament scenes, if speaking to that audience and you get, um, get that chance, you're not allowed in many cases to bring those kind of things. They'll provide those for you. Or if you do bring, like, say, a Naga or a Diamondback, they actually will physically take it apart and inspect it in many cases because they want to make sure you don't have that special stuff in there. Um, they set you up with a standardized level of, of equipment in most mm -hmm. cases. So it's like if you do have an Astronomo, or um, sorry, I just massacred the pronunciation there, but if you do have one, 
if you're getting used to it, you're just hurting yourself because if for some chance you do find, man, I'm really awesome at, at PvP, and you do get the chance to get on one of those teams, you just lost all of those skills because when you actually go to practice and you get into tournaments, you can't use it. And that's that's why it's always a downside with those newer mm -hmm. stuff. Like They have mice now that you can hold with a ball and it will just like follow your... You know, wrist movement. You seen that? You know, yeah, yeah. the virtual yeah. reality ones. You got G, you know, G one ten keyboards that have macro keys wrapping all around the left and top sides. You can't use any of that. Um, I've I've been there. I've seen it. It's very strict. Uh, so don't get spoiled by it. It's nice if you're just going to be casually playing. But for those that are really wanting to get serious into all of that, just forget it. Get yourself a nice mechanical keyboard. Get yourself a high DPI mouse. Uh, Razer makes great one. Microsoft makes great high DPI mice. Get yourself a solid mouse pad, and that's all you need. There's no reason to spend hundreds of dollars on stuff that you can't even use later on. Yeah. I, so, I just uh, need to have at oh. least one, if not a couple of thumb buttons, because I, I always use those in every game. That's just something so, I need. So I had the Nostromo before it was the Nostromo, and it was still the Belkin, whatever the hell it was. <laughs> oh, man. It's, it's a Belkin. And, and, <laughs> yeah. And... Uh, <laughs> I liked I, I got it and then I sent it back because I just hated it so much. I just couldn't get used to it. So the whole thing with me is it's like whatever you're comfortable using, use. I, I, I it's a good time to chime in now because people have been talking about rat. I got the rat seven and I've had it for I don't know. What brand is that? Um I don't even know. It's like Cyborg. Cyborg? Yeah. There you go. Never heard Something. of that. Um and I just like it because it's it has all the adjustable adjustments that kind of like fit it to whatever you want your hand to fit it. Um, someone said it theirs died after a month. I've had this thing for over a year now, or whenever it first came out. Um, and for for a game like like WoW, I I think the Naga is great because you have so many freaking skills you need to be able to <laughs> access quickly. Um, but for something like Guild Wars 2 that you have the eight skills, I think that a normal keyboard, normal mouse will be fine. It's nice having the thumb. I mean, this one, it's got two thumb buttons. But the thing that I like about the Rat 7 is it has a sniping button. Um, <laughs> a sniping button? It'll, slow, yeah. it'll lower your got, DPI? It looks, it looks like the little red button right there, it's got a crosshair on it. And it, yeah, it lowers your DPI so that when you're zoomed in, you can aim a little bit better. Um, oh. So I personally I haven't used it that much, but you know, I think I thought it was a nice little kind of different. I programmed thing that, that damn did. button when I played <laughs> Quake World Team Fortress as a sniper. The only way to to make it zoom in was to have it change the field of view, the fove on the game, right? And I didn't like that the only option that the game presented you by default was just hit a button, it'll zoom all the way in or zoom all the way out, and it didn't actually change your sensitivity or anything, so I wrote a script for my config that each time I scrolled the mouse wheel forward, it would zoom in another level and change the mouse sensitivity, and then if I scrolled back, it would zoom back, and I spent so damn long, and I was so proud when I had finished this thing that would let me zoom in with the mouse wheel to certain, you know, like four or five predetermined distances and have the, the mouse feel correct at each distance. It took me forever, <laughs> but it felt awesome. They don't let you do that anymore. <laughs> yeah. No. I, I will say the one whole... thing, though. Oh, about... go ahead. Oh, sorry. But about the Nostromo, is like, I actually don't use it anymore because I found that when I had to go type, it was really awkward. So to get like off I the just use a keyboard and go now. back to the keyboard. Yeah, I just went back to keyboard because like one, I was start, I started playing StarCraft two. So like you need a keyboard for StarCraft two. I don't care what you say, <laughs> and you need to type in a lot of games. Like every game you play, you need to type. So you need to be able to have like that quick type and then get back right to it. And going from like Nostromo to keyboard and then back, that was awkward. And it kind of sits in this corner of my room right now and collects dust. I don't even haven't used it in like a year or so. So yeah, that's, let's, that's why I sent mine back. Let's talk about how the default setup, at least as far as we know, is for Guild Wars 2. I believe the way that it's set up is similar to most other MMOs. The, the ten skills that are available to your character, the first five number keys, one, two, three, four, five, are your weapon skills. And I believe we've also seen that the tilde key, the one that is next to the number one and above the tab, at least on the U.S. keyboards, that one will switch weapons between the two weapon sets that you have, if I'm not mistaken. Six is your healing, seven, eight, and nine are your utilities, and zero is your elite. Now, that is a bit... Well, let me finish here. 
F1, F2, F3, F4 are class specific skills. So for the Guardian, it's like F1, 2, 3 are those special abilities that the Guardian can use at any given moment. F1 through F4 on an elementalist will change your attunement. On a warrior, if you hit F1, it'll use your burst skill, etc. WASD, of course, will move your character around. F, probably like all other MMOs, is going to be an assist key, something to that effect, or maybe maybe uh, it'll be the, the select key, something like that. So I think we can assume that that is going to be the, the way that the game is going to be set up. Now, I don't know about you guys, but my left hand doesn't have a really good time hitting the 7, 8, 9, and 0 keys, so I think I'm going to be I, rebinding those to my mouse. Let me, uh, just a, a tip to you, Bridger, and anybody else, you should never be moving your hand at all away from, if your middle finger is touching W, yeah. you should never be moving your hand away from that. Your middle right. finger should always be touching W. So I can tell you right now that in terms of the F keys, all of your competitive players or anybody that takes the game halfway seriously is going to be rebinding those to Z, X, and C. Guarantee it. X, I, Hands down. Exactly. I agree um, your Q and E keys are going to, your Q, E, R, and T keys are going to easily replace your 5 through 9, 5 through 0. Any of you guys play WoW, you know that already. Yep. Um, and then anything else that would ever possibly be needed, you'll bind simply to control and then the same letters. You should never be moving your hand across that far across the keyboard ever. It's, it's inefficient and it shouldn't be done. You should have everything quickly twitch available right there to, um, so you don't ever have to stop moving forward or backward. Your, uh, your middle finger essentially should always be available for either a W or S is what I'm getting at. Yeah. So the F1 through 3 or F1 through 4, I don't know what they're Switching between weapon sets, I can see a lot of people already putting that on their mouse wheel. Mm -hmm. um, that's just an obvious. Um, mouse wheels, obviously, will be available in any competitive scene. And then, um, yeah, I mean, who actually, who, uh, and I'm probably not hitting the right note here, but who actually uses 5 through 0 or, or 6 through 0 on their keyboard for I games? I rebind those every time for all the, I have a special <laughs> I, thing I for actually, my mouse. Whenever I play I, RTS games, because I always like making tons of control groups, and I just don't use 6 through 0. I bind those to all my thumb buttons and my other buttons on my mouse. Bam, done. I, I use 6 through 9 mainly for StarCraft, because my 1 through because my one through 4 is like my 1, 2, and 3 my armies, 4 is my bases, and then 5 through whatever are my queens for my different hatches. That's the only reason why I use those, but... Like in, in MMOs, I would use those for skills that I don't use all the time, but I don't feel like binding them somewhere else, like my mount or pulling up the, some other menu or something. But in terms of like quick, quick sort of access, I don't really use it for that. Yeah. yeah. StarCraft's kind of a different story because you're not, you know, you know when you need to press six or seven, you know, for your queens. Obviously, you set that for every cooldown. That's part of your macro management. But, um, in a, in a Twitch scenario like PvP and MMOs, you have to assume that every key could be used at any time. At least mm -hmm. any decent player should. So yeah, it all has to be accessible. If you put it on a 7 and you're trying to pay attention to the screen, you shouldn't be looking to make sure you press 7 instead of 6. You know? so and I want to go having... on a bridge rant because I can't stand the number of <laughs> RTS games oh, <laughs> that start with default keybinds, especially the ones you can't change, Company of Heroes, that say, okay, P is the default key to, to build this unit or to use his special ability because his name is Pioneers. <laughs> so we want to really, make that P. Q. You really can't change binds on Company of Heroes? You can't. I, well, you have, to do, you have to basically do this that whole easily. rigmarole. You, it's not even just a, a file that you can edit. You have to extract a thing, then you can edit it, then you have to repackage it and then put a special well, note in here, the thing to say, oh, use this. One thing we didn't mention, another great thing about gaming keyboards, my, my Razer right here, uh, any of the GE keyboards, you can rebind the keys from a Windows perspective. So that would fix your problem right there. So from Windows, I can make it where Windows will always recognize the number 8 as, as G, you know, for yeah. example. That's really neat. That's pretty useful. I... I had I actually I like grid keys in my RTSs. I really enjoy them, so I wound up building my own set of grid keys once I figured out how to do this, and they became known as Bridger's Grid Keys in the Company of Heroes world. So that was interesting. So um, I think what I'm planning on doing is anything that is going to be spammable, like the one key 
on pretty much every weapon of every class is going to be spammable, right? It's going to ha- basically have zero cooldown. It's going to be your standard, I can't do anything else, so I'll just hit my one key button. It's For a warrior, it's just going to be your standard slash. For your for your bow, it's just going to be your standard, I'm shooting you action. But of course, each class and, and, pew, pew. and, and, uh, and weapon is going to have its own small twist on what the one key can do. For example, warriors, it's got like a three-hit combo thing going on. So anything that's going to be spammable is going to go on my closest thumb button, just because I don't want to have to have my my movement keys leave if I'm going to be spamming that key a lot. And then I'm probably going to put other keys that I hit the most on my thumb buttons. I'm probably going to put my elite skill somewhere on like Q or E, maybe elite and heal, something like that. Or maybe down in the CX, CV things and just save Q, E, R, T for the, for the elementalist attunement, something to make it easy to switch between those. That's, I think, how I'm going to do it. If you follow any of like, um, it's like Swifty or, I mean, he's... <clears throat> Everybody has their own opinion on him, but if you follow, I mean, if you follow any major programmer, they're all pretty much going to recommend base it on cooldown. Now, we know Guild Wars 2 is a cooldown-focused game, so if you have an elite, obviously long cooldown, you want to put that further away, so you might put that at, like, V or something, but I'm sure we'll be talking all about that, (laughs) hopefully sooner than later, right, Bridger? Absolutely. (laughs) Oh, I'm I'm really hoping to. we'll We'll have an episode for all of you guys where we talk about our setups uh, for PvP or PvE or whatever, I'm sure. It'll be great. Yep, yep. It'll be a good time. But I think uh, I think we uh, wrapping this one up, and I can only hope that we have something awesome to talk about next week. Uh, maybe World versus we'll, World Info? Maybe, maybe. <laughs> maybe. We'll see. Uh, it's, it's ramping up. We're getting closer and closer. So, uh, I guess it's time to, uh, to start closing this one out here. Let's get going. Thanks everybody for tuning in. We're glad to have you. 121 people I think was the peak I saw today. Fantastic. If you're just listening to the podcast, what are you doing? Show up. Uh, We're going to try and maybe do some earlier shows for you guys in Europe. I understand that uh, not everybody can make it to these when they're 8 o'clock at night. It's just much more convenient for us, but maybe every other month or so we'll try and have a show early just for you Euros. Uh, But... For tonight, we are over. For the rest of the guys, I am Bridger signing off. Have a good night. See you guys. Good night. See you.